Welcome to Magical Storybook, a collection of children's stories from around the world. Beauty and the Beast Long ago lived a very rich merchant. He had six children, three sons and three daughters. His daughters were extremely handsome, especially his youngest, and as she was growing up, Everyone referred to her as the Little Beauty. And when she was older, people still called her Beauty, which made her sisters very jealous. Because they were rich and spoiled, Beauty's sisters were full of pride. They would not visit the daughters of the other merchants, saying that they would only associate with people of nobility, and each day they would entertain themselves by attending balls, concerts and plays. Beauty would instead spend her days reading books, much to the amusement of her sisters. One day, the merchant received some terrible news. The ships that had been carrying the goods that he was to sell had hit a storm and sunk. He had lost his fortune. He sat his six children down and told them that he could no longer afford their townhouse and that they must go and live in a small country house far away. The children were very upset and the two older sisters quickly tried to marry so that they could stay in the town. But because they were poor now, none of their rich acquaintances wanted them and because of their pride, no one else wanted them either. Let them go and find their quality friends among the milking cows, the townsfolk laughed, glad to see them humbled at last. Beauty was such a charming and sweet-tempered girl that she told herself crying would not make things better and that she must now try to make herself happy without a fortune. When they arrived at their country house, the merchant and his three sons set to work growing crops and tending to the animals, while Beauty would get up at four in the morning to ensure that the house was clean and that the family had dinner on the table in the evenings. In the beginning, she found it difficult, as she was not used to doing a servant's work, but within a few weeks, she began to enjoy having something to do and grew strong and healthy. Then after her work was finished, she would read or spin or play the harpsichord while singing. Her two sisters, on the other hand, did not know how to spend their time. They would stay in bed until ten and then do nothing but wander around all day, grumbling about the loss of their fine clothes and rich friends. They not only left Beauty to do all the housework, they also insulted her at every opportunity. Look at our sister, they would say. What a poor, stupid creature she is, to be contented with such a miserable situation. But Beauty did not let their words dampen her cheery nature. One day, the merchant received a letter saying that one of the ships with his goods on had unexpectedly arrived safely at the port. His older daughters became excited that their fortunes may have been recovered and when they saw their father preparing himself for the long journey, they begged him to bring them back some new gowns and ribbons. And what will you have, Beauty? asked her father. She worried that the salvaged goods on the ship may not have been enough to give them back their riches, so she answered, Since you have been good enough to think of me, please bring me back a rose, for none grow hereabouts. They are indeed rare. The merchant set off towards the town, but he was not able to claim any of his merchandise from the ship, and he returned home as poor as when he left. He was riding through a forest about 30 miles from home when he became lost. While he was trying to find the path home, it began to rain and snow, and the wind became so fierce that it nearly blew him off his horse. When the night started to draw in, he panicked that he would freeze to death or be eaten by the wolves that he could hear howling around him. So he walked on a little further 
and was relieved when he saw a light in the distance. He rode towards it, down a long walkway of trees, until he saw a palace that was lit from top to bottom. The merchant sped towards it, and when he got there, he saw a stable open, so he took his horse inside and left her to feed on the manger of hay and oats. When the horse was settled, the merchant walked up to the house. He was surprised that he didn't meet anyone in the outer courtyards. Inside the house, he called out, but there was no response. He walked through a door into a great hall, where there was a roaring fire and a table with dinner laid out for one person. He drew the chair near to the fire and sat down to warm himself. I hope that the master of the house or his servants will excuse the liberty I take, he thought, expecting them to appear any moment. But he waited and waited, and even when the clock struck eleven, there was still no sign of life. Eventually he felt so hungry that he took some chicken from the table and ate it up, worried the whole time that he was eating someone's dinner. After this, he drank a few glasses of wine, and then, when he was feeling more courageous, he began to wander around the house. He passed through several grand rooms with magnificent furniture, and eventually came to a bedchamber. As it was now past midnight, and he was so tired, the merchant closed the door and went to sleep. It was ten o'clock the next morning when he finally awoke. As he sat up, he was astonished to see a good set of clothes laid out in place of his own soaked clothes. He looked out of the window and saw that the snow had completely disappeared. The window was overlooking a garden with the most beautiful wooden arches, covered in the most stunning flowers he had ever seen. He got dressed and returned to the great hall, where he found some breakfast laid out for him on the table. Thank you, he said out loud, to whoever may have been listening. I am extremely grateful for your kind favours. The merchant ate his breakfast, and then went to look for his horse. But while he was on his way to the stable, he passed through a garden of roses. He remembered Beauty's request, and picked one. Immediately he heard a great noise and saw a frightful beast coming towards him. You ungrateful man, said the beast in a terrifying voice. I saved your life by receiving you into my castle and in return you steal my roses, which I value more than anything. You shall die for that. The merchant fell to his knees and lifted up both of his hands. My lord, he begged, please forgive me. I had no intention of offending you. I gathered a rose for one of my daughters who asked me to bring her one home. The beast looked interested and said, I will forgive you on one condition, that one of your daughters comes to me willingly and dies in your place. The merchant was horrified, but the beast continued. If your daughter refuses to die in your place, you yourself must return in three months. The merchant had no plan to sacrifice one of his daughters to this monster, but he agreed, knowing that he would at least be able to see them one last time. The beast then told him that he was free to leave whenever he pleased, and added, You shall not depart empty-handed. Go back to the room where you slept, and you will see a great empty chest. Fill it with whatever you like best, and I will send it to your home. Then without another word, the beast left. The merchant went up to the bedchamber and filled the chest with gold, knowing that if he was to die, he could at least leave something to his poor children. Then he collected his horse and left the palace, feeling very sad. Within a few hours, he was home. 
His children were happy to see their father return, but instead of receiving their embraces with happiness, he held up the rose and told them what had happened. His son said that they would find the beast and kill him, but their father told them of his strength and that they had little chance of overpowering him. Beauty said that she would willingly give up her life to save her father's, but he would not hear of it. I am old, I have not long to live, he said. You shall not go to the palace without me, insisted Beauty. That night, when the merchant shut his bedroom door, he was shocked to see the chest of gold lying next to his bed. Three months later, Beauty and her father said a sad goodbye to her brothers and sisters and rode to the palace in the forest. They entered the great hall and found a table splendidly laid with a banquet for two. Though neither of them had any appetite, they both sat down and ate, each trying to appear cheerful for the other. As soon as they had finished, they heard a great noise and the merchant in a flood of tears bid poor Beauty farewell as the beast entered the room. Beauty was terrified when she saw him, but tried to be as brave as she could. The beast thanked her for coming willingly and then told her father that in the morning he should leave and never think of coming back to the palace again. Then he left the room. Old oh, daughter, said the merchant, embracing Beauty and begging her to let him take her place. But as frightened as she was, she would not hear of it. That night, Beauty dreamed that a fine lady came to her and said, Beauty, your goodness in giving up your own life to save your father's shall not go unrewarded. Her father left the next morning, and Beauty, believing that this was her last day on earth, decided to walk around the fine castle. She found that it was a delightful, pleasant place, and she was extremely surprised at seeing a door over which was written Beauty's Apartment. She opened it and was quite dazzled by the magnificent objects inside. There was a large library, a harpsichord, and several music books. This sight gave her hope that if she were only to be here for a day, that they surely would not have gone to so much trouble. With fresh courage, she opened the library door and took out a book. There were words written inside it in gold letters. Welcome, beauty. Banish fear. You are queen and mistress here. Speak your wishes, speak your will. Swift obedience meets them still. Alas, she said, there is nothing I desire so much as to see my poor father and to know what he is doing now. No sooner had she said this when her eyes turned towards a large curious mirror on the wall and to her amazement she saw her father arriving home and her sisters running to greet him. He looked very sad, but her sisters did little to hide their joy that he had returned and that their sister had not. A moment later the images disappeared and Beauty was left looking at her own tearful face. At noon, she found a dinner laid out for her, and while she ate, she was entertained with concert music, although she could see no musicians. That evening, when she went back down to the hall to dine, the beast appeared. "'Will you give me leave to sit with you while you eat?' he asked. Y "'You may do as you please,' she trembled. "'No,' replied the beast. You are mistress of this house now. You only need to tell me to go if my presence upsets you, and I shall. But tell me first, he added, do you think me very ugly? 
That is true, said Beauty, for I cannot tell a lie, but I believe that you are very good-natured. Do you think me stupid? asked the Beast. Oh no, said Beauty, I see no stupidity within you. Eat then, Beauty, he said, and please try to amuse yourself in your palace, for everything here is yours. I should be very sad if you were not happy. You are very kind, smiled Beauty. Because of that, your deformity barely appears. My heart is good, he sighed, but I am still a monster. Among mankind, said Beauty kindly, there are many that deserve the name monster more than you. I prefer you just as you are, than someone under human form who hides a treacherous and ungrateful heart. I thank you for such a compliment, said the beast. She finished her meal in the beast's company, and soon her fear of him had almost gone, until he suddenly asked, Beauty, will you be my wife? She was so scared of making him angry that it took her some time to answer. But she eventually said, No, beast. He sighed so loudly with despair that the whole palace echoed, and then he left the room with a simple, Farewell, Beauty. When Beauty was alone, she felt great pity and compassion for the beast. She spent the next three months very contentedly at the palace. Every evening the beast would visit her and talk to her during supper, and Beauty soon began to very much enjoy his company, and she looked forward to his visits. But every night he would ask her to be his wife, and every night she would say, No, beast. I know too well my own misfortune, he said to her one evening, but I will be happy if you will just stay here with me. Will you promise that? Beauty went to her room and looked into the mirror. She saw her father sick in bed. She said to the beast, I promise that I shall stay. However, I need to go now and see my father. He is pining for me and I long to see him again. I shall return within a week. The beast gave her a ring and said, When you want to return, you need only lay this on your bedside table before you go to bed. Farewell, beauty, he sighed. The next morning when Beauty awoke, she saw that she was back in her father's house. Next to her was a large trunk full of fine clothes covered in gold and diamonds. She thanked the beast for taking care of her and went to find her father. They were overjoyed to see each other and held each other for what seemed like forever. Her father told her that her sisters were now married and that her brothers had joined the army. When they heard of Beauty's return, her sisters came to visit. They were so envious of her fine clothes that they plotted to be nice to her in the hope that they could make her stay longer than a week and make the beast angry with her. Hopefully he will then devour her, they laughed. Their plan worked. For the first time in her life, her sisters were so affectionate to Beauty that she wept for joy. And when the week was over, they begged her to stay, which she did. Beauty missed the beast terribly and longed to see him again. But after ten days, she was still at her father's house. That night, she dreamt that she was in the palace garden and that she saw the beast lying on the ground, dying. She woke up with a start. Oh, why did I refuse to marry him? She thought. He is good and kind, and he has made me so happy. His appearance is not his fault, and I should be happier with him than my sisters are with their husbands, who are handsome to look at and witty. She immediately placed the ring on the table, and went back to sleep. 
When she woke the next morning, she was thrilled to find herself back at the palace. She got dressed and ran to find him. He was nowhere to be seen. She waited until supper time, as he never missed eating with her. But when nine o'clock came, and he still did not appear, she felt a deep sorrow. Remembering her dream, she ran out into the garden and found the beast lying on the grass in the very same place. She threw her arms around him with no fear in her heart at all and felt his heart beating. The beast opened his eyes. I thought that you were never coming back, he said. I have been so sick that I am dying, but I die happy having seen you one last time. No, dear beast, cried Beauty. You must not die. I cannot live without you. I want to marry you. She had hardly finished saying these words when she saw the palace sparkle with light. Fireworks began to explode and instruments began playing as though they were marking some great event. She turned back to her dear beast and saw with great surprise that he was gone. In her arms now lay a man with one of the most beautiful faces she had ever seen. Where is my beast? she asked. I am here, said the man. I am really a prince. A wicked fairy condemned me to take the shape of a beast until someone with a true heart could see past my looks and love me enough to marry me. Beauty held out her hand to help the prince up and together they went into the castle. She was overjoyed to see her father and the rest of her family standing in the great hall. A lady stepped forward. It was the beautiful lady who had appeared to her in the dream. Beauty, said the lady, you learned to believe in kindness and a good heart over handsomeness and false charm. And so you deserve to be united with someone who values the same things. You will be a great queen. Come and receive your reward. Then the lady turned to Beauty's sisters. As for you two ladies, she said, I know your hearts and all the malice they contain. You shall become two statues, but be as conscious as you are now, and it will be your punishment to stand before your sister's palace gate and witness her happiness. You will not have the power to return to your original state until you own your faults. Pride, anger and idleness are sometimes conquered, but converting a malicious and envious mind takes a miracle. Because of this, I fear that you will always remain statues. Then, with a swish of her wand, everyone in the Great Hall was transported to the Prince's kingdom, where his subjects received him with joy. Beauty and the Prince were married, and their happiness, as it was based on a foundation of kindness and understanding, was complete. If you enjoy Magical Storybooks English Nanny Bedtime Stories, please let us know by leaving us a review. Or you can let us know at our website www.magical-storybook.com The link is in the details.